right, welcome everyone. Uh, I appreciate you taking your time this afternoon. My name is Olive Brendan O'Coring, Laurel, and I have the honor of moderating today's panel discussion on professionalism in performance. Your panelists today are not only noted performers in the SCA, they also have many years professional experience out in the real world, trademark, getting paid, as my dad would say, American money to do what they do. We'll have a brief round of introductions and then talk about the three phases of performance, preparation, setup, and the performance itself. Please put questions in the chat. If we've timed this out right, we should have about 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. We have with us today Count William of Fairhaven, who as his alter, give us a wave, uh, Count William of Fairhaven, who as his alter ego, Pat Savelli, leads the very successful Irish pub band, Fin Tan. We have Master Tonus Von Driel, a longtime member of the famed Whiskey Bards, who have performed for years at festivals across the country. And we have Signore Tommaso Franceschi, premier apprentice of Dame Estelle de la Mer, who is my go-to guy for Renaissance guitar and hand drum, who, as the mild-mannered Charles Krug, has over four decades of professional bar band experience, including a stint with Jimmy Doerr's Polka Christmas Tour. So let's hear a bit more from each of them. William. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Count William of Fairhaven. I've been in the SCA since 1981. I started playing guitar in 1989, though I've been doing music my whole life. Formed a project with some local SCA musicians, recorded two albums under our own label called Eccentric, 92 and 96. 2002, I formed the Irish pub band Fintan. We've seven albums to our credit, two tours of Ireland, one tour of Scotland, and I've played gigs everywhere you can think of. I quit tracking gigs with Fintan when we crossed 500 five or six years ago. I don't really actually know how many gigs we've played. On to you, Tonus. Thank you, William. <clears throat> Everybody, I'm Tonus Van Driel, formerly of Vadenbilt, before I moved to mid uh, I've been actually performing since I was two years old. When I joined the SCA in 94, I saw an opportunity to put my 60 plus hours of undergrad music study to use and began writing songs and poetry and was thankfully introduced to fire crawling by Rafle Dunoir, the Black Bart of Meridiers, and kind of took off from there. Uh, shortly thereafter, met another performer in the SCA, Shim Kierker. We formed that four-part vocal group, the Whiskey Bards, over 20 years ago, uh, resulting in four CDs, one of which surprisingly hit the Billboard charts for a week. Ran the Crystal Flute Bardic and Crystal Flute Filk competitions at Australia for 10 years and have been Kingdom Bard in two kingdoms. At this point, mostly I perform at Ren Fairs, SCA events, and an occasional pub. Uh, for me, though, my real SCA Bardic journey has involved lots and lots and lots of fire crawling. Tommaso. One of these things is not like the others. Three peers and me. Um, I do have a kingdom level uh, uh, award of arms level award. It's a beautiful scroll that tells you all about my bread baking. My award of arms praises my work in studying the marital arts. Yes, it is a verbatim quote from the gloss. Uh, my wife occasionally appreciates that and sometimes is annoyed by it. Obviously, I'm not important. On the other hand, I've gotten a message on Wednesday saying, Tommaso, Dancer's Revolt is this weekend. Here's the music. You can play for us, right? At Middle Kingdom 50 year, someone came to my camp and bodily dragged me out of my tent. Now, it was Delicia, so she can do a good amount of dragging and dragged me off to play a ball for her with, with next to no notice. And as Brendan says, people come to me and ask me questions about percussion and, and fretted strings. It's uh, Charles Krug, uh, same as the wine, though unfortunately not related. I've been playing keyboard for about 50 years, singing as long as I can remember and play percussion, fretted strings and a few other things. Been playing professionally for 42 years, lounges, weddings. I've been a church organist. I've been a choir director. Most of my experiences in bar bands where people tell you helpful things like, play Freebird or you suck. 
we don't play Freebird. Unlike William, I never bothered counting how many shows I've done, but I was the innkeeper with the Jimmy Stir Polka Christmas Tour with Whispering Bill Anderson and the fabulous Myron Florin. If you've never seen someone play virtuoso accordion, it is mind blowing. <laughs> World Sarah. But that's me. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, as you can see, we have a, a rather experienced lineup here, well over a century of professional performing experience. Um, me, I've mostly played for drinks and tips. So we're going to start with preparation. What you do long before the gig begins. How do you pick your preferred audience? You can't always pick your audience, but you can pick the folks that you'd like to play with and those that, that you just know our music is just not going to work for this crowd. Deciding on your preferred venues. Me, I don't like doing feasts. Um, selecting your material. Working it up. The difference between practice and rehearsal. And there is a difference, as I think you will hear. William. Thanks, Brendan. So one thing I would say, if you're going, if you want to be a performer, and if you seriously wish to pursue it, pick a thing that you love as your performing style. I can tell you that there are, I love playing Irish pub music like you wouldn't believe. And there are days that I don't love it. And yet I go do it because I love it. And so you want to have that thing. We've been told a million times, oh, you guys should learn some covers. Yeah, then you're just another cover band and you're not an Irish pub band anymore. So that's important and preparations, everything. We have songs we have literally probably played 10,000 times and we still run them the practice before we perform. I don't even know how many times I've played whiskey in the jar, but I can tell you that I'm going to be playing it again at practice before St. Patty's Day this week because that's what you got to do. Additionally, have enough pieces in the genre you pick that you can change gears. I mean, like Brennan mentioned, reading your audience is a skill you need to have. And that's part of prep. Figure out where the sweet spot is. We play pubs. There are a handful of non-pubs we play, but we don't play heavy metal bars. We don't play country bars. We know that that's not going to work because we're not playing what they want to hear. So, you know, find the thing you want to do and just do do it and don't change when people say, oh, you know, we'd rather have some other kind of band. Oh, hey, thanks for talking to us. We'll go find someplace else to play. There are always more gigs. I guarantee it. One door closes, another door opens, and you just have to stick with it long enough to get good at it. And there's no substitute for performing like performing, which probably segues well for Tanis. I'm sure he's Uh, just a, a few comments there, William. Thank you. Uh, mostly for myself, I perform specifically war songs, drinking songs, pirate fun songs, things you would see at a Ren Faire or SCA event. Uh, I have other items in my repertoire, but a lot of those other items are more add-ins when appropriate. As William said, you have to know who you are as a performer first. If you know who you are and are true to that, your audience will follow provided you do the work to reach and prepare them accordingly. Uh, now for me as a soloist or as a member of the Whiskey Bards, the, the nature of the upcoming gig makes a big difference in how I prepare. The most critical regardless is practice, practice, and oh yeah, more practice. Memorization, preparation, absolutely critical to a good show. The vast majority of my shows have either been Ren Fairs, SCA stage shows, or like I said, lots of fire crawling. But if we have a predetermined audience or an identified host, we will actively ask in advance what style of performance they want so we can prepare accordingly. If the show is a stage show or a fair with a lot of stage shows, which we then vary material from show to show, there are core songs we have to polish no matter how many times we've done it. This includes having recordings of the full arrangements so each of us can practice over and over again, even when we're driving. And then we'll still double check all of them on site before actually adding them to a set on any given day. If I'm going to do a solo set and I'm about out of practice, I will practice that entire set in order repeatedly for weeks in advance, at least an hour a day, four to five days a week. Even though I've known most of the songs I'll perform for many years, most any song I perform for a formal stage show or fire crawl 
I will spend a minimum of 20 plus hours each on each piece. You know, I just wanted to, you just brought something up. I just wanted yeah. this to take 30 seconds. My band, so you never perform anything that's not prepared, period. Do not do it. No matter what the inducement is, don't do it. My band did a song that was extremely difficult at the request of somebody and we weren't ready for it. And it cost us, and I want to be very clear, seven years of not being invited to the Irish festival in the town I live in because the entire panel that books for that thing saw us and said, those guys suck. Yeah, absolutely. So as the set list, um, I tend to build them with an intentional emotional roller coaster style of set ranging from high energy, funny, pretty sentimental power pieces back to maybe a slower or more depressive piece. And then the energy has to come back up and end on a high note. So especially if we only get a 30 to 50 minute set, this is the structure we use. If we're doing multiple 30 minute sets, we have the opportunity to pick a different theme for each one, but still follow some level of uh, emotional journey. Uh, now for a lot of those, the themes may be drinking and funny, drinking and war, drinking and pirate. You know, we are the whiskey bard, so it fits, uh, but also high energy or uh, body, whatever the case may be. As a practice versus rehearsal, and this is where I'll kind of wrap this up, Practice to me is just learning the piece and the intricacies in it. When rehearsing though, I actively begin thinking about specific emotions that the song should elicit, including any emotional changes within the song, deciding on appropriate hand motions, body positioning, facial expressions. I then begin rehearsing every piece, envisioning I have a live audience and I'm interacting with them, including seeing their possible reactions and how I will then respond depending on those reactions. So a lot of visualization goes into my performance prep. And this is a lot of, here's the key word, intentionality in everything I'm going to do. If the audience is indeed everything, I owe them this level of preparation. Tommaso. I rehearsed this speech. I rehearsed my introduction speech if you've seen me do the same story twice, you've heard me do exactly the same intro both times. If I start out saying, they tell you that fairy stories are for children, my wife rolls her eyes, but everybody who's heard me know that's how I introduced the, the original-ish story of the Frog Prince, which is a lot dirtier than the Disney version. I'm preparing right now for two shows at Penzik, one solo show for an hour and a show that I'm doing with Zof. Uh, the most funniest thing in the world is when I approached Zof and said, hey, you want to do a show? You want me to do a show with you? Yeah, really? It's like we're gushing over each other for 10 minutes. It's hysterical. But I'm preparing. I did the show last summer at the event we shall not name and tried out some things. And as a result of that trial, there's some stuff I'm dropping, there's stuff I'm adding. That's six months from now. I'm learning the material now. I put that into a set. I know about how long every song is. I play the whole set with the stopwatch going. With the stopwatch going, I see, oh, I have five minutes extra. Let's try another song in there. Or, ooh, I'm a little bit long. I got to cut this, got to cut that. There's things that you think about. You have your wife watch you and she says helpful things like, you sure you want to do that song? Which means under no circumstances on any planet in the known universe should I be doing that song or that story. Uh, it's vitally, if you have someone who will be honest with you and tell you when your stuff is working, when your stuff is not working, um, have you, if you're a singer, you have done this. You listen to a recording by a high value pop star and you think, why did they breathe there? Usually it's because they, you know, like Taylor Swift is breathing in the middle of a word. Taylor Swift has all the takes in the world that she wants. So you stop and think, oh, you think, first thought is, what an idiot. She's breathing in the middle of a word. Then you stop and think, wait a minute, she has however many takes she wants to put on her recording and she chose to put a breath in the middle of a word. 
And then you're starting to think what must be going on in her mind. And if you're a singer, you absolutely positively are thinking about where every breath takes place. If I'm playing a guitar, I work out very carefully where my hands are and repeat the pattern over and over and over again. Because even if it's quote cowboy chords where you're just playing the normal chords, sometimes you have to get yourself into a different chord or into a different position to play a little run or do something different. You have to work through all of these things. And all of these things are levels of preparation that kitty, an amateur doesn't necessarily think about. You know, someone comes in to a bardic circle and does a song they just did, they do a song they just did. You won't hear them do, you hear them do the song again, you won't hear them do the same intro because they've never performed it to the level of this is my intro, this is how I do this song. Because what setting the intro does gets you in the brain space for that song it's all part of how that song works together uh, if i'm reciting jabberwocky for me that's an extremely physical piece i want to be outdoors at a fire where i can move around and ha have a good sword fight where i'm killing the getting that vorpal blade out and swinging it around there's all these pieces of the puzzle that go into that and there's really no substitute for the preparation and, and it seems incredibly boring and, and silly stuff like this how many of you have seen me at bardic madness where i've had to move a music stand every time if i'm playing a guitar piece and i have to use a music stand i have a story about how disreputable guitar players are. And I tell the story while I'm fussing with the music stand. This is not spontaneous. This is planned. This is considered. It keeps people, me, keeps me in the mindset of I'm playing guitar now. And people don't see, ah, this crappy thing. I gotta move it again. Unless you're doing Popeye, no one wants to see that. So even if you're just doing you know, the easiest performance space in the SCA is the Bardic Circle. Even if you're just doing a Bardic Circle, the next thing you can do for your performance is think about, wait a minute, what is the whole picture I'm trying to do? And, and that's something that we all need to think about more. And so let's prepare. Brendan. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, yeah, Penzik, six months from now, already preparing, already rehearsing. Think about that. So we talked about preparation. What do you do long, long before the gig? Now let's talk about the day of. What do you do as you arrive at the venue and prepare to perform? What do you do before you show up? at the venue because as soon as you are in view you are on stage so what do you take care of before you show up a pilot has a pre-flight routine that starts long before engine starts checking the weather at home checking to see if there's any issues at the airport where you're flying to then you inspect the airplane you walk around the airplane you check the level of the fuel tanks long before you even start the engine. There's a whole list of things that you do. So let's go around again, William and Tonus and Tommaso, and what are your pre-flight routines up to the point of starting the first piece? So the first thing is, uh, let's do it from a, a, a pub gig. So this is typically a three hour gig we get paid $500 and a $100 meal comp, no alcohol. We show up two hours before we're going to be on stage because it takes us an hour to set up the sound system. First thing we do is we check in with either the bar manager or the pub manager, depending on who's available. We check in with somebody. Hey, we're here. We're going to set up. We set up professionally. 
We don't do a lot of grab ass. We don't make off color jokes. You're on. I, it was Corey who just said it. You step foot in the establishment at this. You're on. Don't screw it up. <laughs> just don't. We've seen it done enough times. We've done it. I mean, when we started, we didn't know any of this stuff. We had no band experience. So we check in. We find out who's going to be our server. So I don't forget to mention it. We tip our server at any pub we play at $20 right off the top of the money we make no matter what. If we get paid $100, she gets a 20. If we get paid $500, might get more than a 20. When we're paid on comp, this, your server gets nothing. Learn to, you should be doing it anyways, but if you learn to treat the staff well, you can get and do anything you need. Get your setup. If you have new equipment you have never tried out, do not bring it to the pub to try out. The look on Corey's face says it all. <laughs> you don't test out your gear. We actually will set up the entire sound system in the backyard, in the in my base. I have a pub in my house and test all the gear. You don't ever do that someplace. You never you don't take a, a an instrument you've never played before to it to a gig. You just don't. And you get set up and you start on time, absolutely on time or a minute early. Play long, take short breaks. Complaints that have allowed us to flourish and other bands to wither and vanish. We were playing a gig and we started, we played play eight to 11. So that's an hour 20, 20 break, hour 20. That's how we do it. And you go, oh my God, who can play an hour 20? We can actually play for two and a half hours straight because we've done it. Not a great choice, but. We started at eight, we finished at 9.20, sat for a bit, got a, got a pint, relaxed. And the manager came up and said, wow, you guys, you guys really play, you started on time. And I was like, well, yeah, you're paying us to start at eight. Would you like us to start later? No, 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 no. So we take our little short break and boom, we're back on it. Doing exactly what Thomas was talking about. We have crafted playlists. They take you up and down. Can't be up here all the time. Can't be down here all the time. Tempo change, key change, all that stuff. Teach it in my performance classes. But, and we hit 11 and the crowd was cranking. We were in Indianapolis at a bar that doesn't exist anymore. So we played on to about five or 10 after. And says, we were playing for free. No, that's an investment. And when we got done, the guy said, well, you sure play a lot. Uh, you're paying us to play a lot. Would you like us to play less? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, I, Tommaso is laughing. I mean, you know, yeah, it's, these things seem really simple, but it's hard won knowledge over decades of performing to just get into your thing. It's, you're being paid. You are a professional. Whether you do it all the time or not, it's not the point. We are professional amateurs. We play 20 to 30 gigs a year and we make. Twelve to eighteen thousand dollars for the band, most of which we reinvest in gear. Everybody in my band has a pro grade instrument or two or five, but that's what it is. And if you're not shooting for that, you're going to struggle or you're going to be very disappointed, you know, because you need to be professional with these people because they can hire somebody else, and it won't be you. Donis, you're on. Thank you, William. I have to laugh because we all kind of wrote out outlines of what we're going to say for these questions ahead of time without looking at what each other was going to say. And I feel like I'm repeating you. <laughs> Step number one, before you ever get there, hydrate, make sure you've had enough to eat, especially protein because physical energy drop on stage is categorically bad. Now, I cannot stress this enough. As a performer, Everything I do is about the people present, meeting people where they're at, which means laying out my expectations internally, but being willing to pivot at any point to ensure I'm reaching them in the way they need. Sometimes I get it right, and sometimes I don't. It's not a perfect thing. So to me, establishing a relationship with the host, any technical or support crew, and any early audience members up front is really, really important. I see performance as a relational experience. Respect for everyone involved underpins the entire experience. Respect for the host and their preferences. Respect for the support crew. Always remember when dealing with an actual tech crew, they have access to the suck button 
treat them with respect and they won't push said button. But also respect for the audience. Regardless of how popular you may be as a performer, you are still a person just like everyone else there and should be reachable. Part of showing respect is being professional in all you do. You know, show up on time, do what you say you're gonna do. Be sober, be polite, be forgiving and understanding when inevitable challenges arise. Lend a hand where you can and be approachable. Now, as far as on-site prep order, this is basically my approach. I meet the host and the support crew. I then look at the environment, make decisions on staging, projection, possible physical challenges or opportunities, and begin adjusting my thought process on how the presentation is actually going to play out. I will test the acoustics from stage and various points around the audience seating because I rarely stay on stage for an entire show. I'm very mobile, very cabaret, personal style. Uh, also look to meet any other performers and build rapport there. If audience members are nearby, I'll make it a point to introduce myself and chat with them as an equal human being. If my ego restraints have begun to slip, I actively remind myself of my mantra. Bards have no ego. Finally, based on what I glean from these person-to-person -person discussions, I actively adjust my set list to ensure timing and flow are correct. No songs that will distract from what is wanted are included. Which songs I can cut if the set looks like it's running long. Uh, kind of jumping ahead a little bit, if I can get someone, either the host or support staff, to watch time and let me know if I'm 10 minutes out, makes it much easier for me to adjust my final timing, not just to not run over, to, but to make sure I finish the set with the energy I want and not spend the whole time blatantly looking at my watch, which is very disruptive to show in any kind of a pseudo period environment. And, and that's pretty much my pre-prep and what I do on site. I'll expand a lot more in the next section. Tommaso. So when you're eating, the first people you're going to meet are the barman, the bar back, maybe the bouncer and the wait staff. Um, this is extremely important. I don't care what your gender is. Do not under any circumstances hit on the staff. The staff will remember and they do not like it. They, are, they're, they face drunks all night long. So how does this apply to the SCA? Well, you're down the bog. There's a lot of people drinking, men and women there. You see someone that you're attracted to. You do not under any circumstances hit on that person while you're playing. Because they're surrounded by drunk people who are hitting on them. That's the last thing your audience member needs. And it's mostly us dudes who do it. I will be honest, but don't do it. Um, be nice to the staff. The staff will remember you. That is either good or bad. Mundanely, we play a lot of Motown. Now, my guitar player is a metal guy. I'm basically a soul guy. Why do we play Motown? You play Motown because women like to dance to Motown. If women are dancing to Motown, men will get up and dance. If men are up and dancing, men will be drinking beer. If the men are drinking beer, the bartender and the staff remembers that you're a really good band. So William and my job is to sell beer. If we're selling beer, everybody's happy. I just so, got to add, I always say, how many Guinnesses do we have to sell to justify them putting us on stage? Exactly. Exactly. So when you set up, you show up on time. Um, don't forget to hydrate. Don't forget to eat. Don't forget to, don't forget to show up rested. If you're performing well, it is incredibly physical. Stand up and sing with a full voice without a sound system. Try doing it for half an hour. Heck, try doing it for 10 minutes. When um, Beatrice and my voice teacher was, we were at a, he was doing a, a group lesson for all of his students. And we're in this old church and he was, one of the tenors was having trouble with projection. He says, oh, you brace your feet on the floor. And JB braced his feet on the floor and shredded the carpet. 
just this this big base stood and shredded the carpet because that is the physicality involved in singing. So for those of us who sing and play, you've got the physicality of singing, you've got the physicality of playing. Um, don't be afraid to take a walk now and then because your aerobic capacity is absolutely related to your ability to perform. Eat a salad because if you've got a digestive issue and it hits hit you on stage, it's a very bad performance. You know, there's all of this stuff that around your life goes into, if you are, if, if I, I was camping in a bog camp and they were giving out booze all night long. Well, the next day I have a performance at the PA tent. It would be a very bad idea for me to sit in the bog bar and drink uh, rum and sp uh, Dr. Pepper and spiced rum they were serving. It was delicious. It would be a very bad idea to sit up and drink the quantity they were drinking and be hung over the next day and not able to perform. So it's everything that it's, it's a lot more than just the physicality of the equipment, but it also gets into how you live your life and, and how you, you owe it to your art to take care of stuff like that. Brendan. All right, thanks very much. Um... Lots and lots of good advice. Um, make sure you're hydrated. Go to the bathroom. Blow your nose. Scratch. Adjust your clothing. Because when you show up, when you, you step on stage as soon as you enter the venue, because people are looking at you and say, oh, there's that guy. There's that girl. She's going to do that thing. Um, as far as um, uh, hitting on folks, um, being this old and having been married for 30 years um, insulates that pretty, pretty well. But I can think back 40 years ago and yeah, uh, somebody should have given me that advice. Um, can I just tack in, Corey? I can't tell you how much I've been hit on, which is exceptionally weird. Because anybody who knows me, I'm like the most married guy I know, except for some of the folks that I hang with. But somebody sees you up there performing, and to them, you're doing something magical that they can't conceive. And so you can be desired, which is certainly a great shot to the old ego, but wow, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. Don't do it. Absolutely. So we did our preparation long before pick the set list, rehearse, 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 practice, 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 practice. We show up, we're prepared, we're ready to go. We step on stage, we hit that first chord, and boom, it's magic, it's mudslide. So how do you manage the performance in real time, especially when things go sideways. And it's not just tornadoes at Penzik. It could be equipment failures. Um, I have broken so many strings, I can't tell you. Um, rowdy audiences that are a little more rowdy than you really want. Drowsy audiences. The drunks. The, the, the amoeba that enters camp in the middle of your set. How do you deal with that? Oh, and, and, and brain farts. Like, I'll, if we have time, I'll tell you the story from Renfair. All right, so a couple of things. Uh, and this touched on something Tanis mentioned earlier. And it also, that Tomaso mentioned, we all talk about this stuff. What, you need to have your set built and ready, whether it's one song, and then you have a, a, a backup, or it's three songs, or it's an hour and 20 minutes, or it's whatever, you need that set pre-built, which means you need to time all your songs. You need to know how long these songs take to play. You cannot make a set list for a time window if you haven't the slightest idea. And I don't mean sort of kind of, well, maybe it's six minutes. We time every song. Then we assume we're going to play it 10% faster because when you play live, <laughs> the, the, the looks from my compatriots. So... You should have some slot in songs 
And then just like Donna said, perhaps the audience gets engaged, you get into some friendly banter, it burns up some time, you need to be able to pull a song. And you need to have all that set up. And in our band, I mean, Karen, uh, Lady Juliana the Meek, she does it. She's the mistress of the set list, period. And she tells us what we're playing next because you can't have six people in the band suggesting songs in the middle of a live show. Hey, let, uh, uh, but we work on these. We were just timing, we were timing pieces. We were practicing to just get a feel for how long they were going to be. I and mean, these aren't even songs that are probably going to be ready for prime time. Another two months, spare everything, mostly cables, <laughs> lots and lots of spare cables. And if you break a string, I can't tell you the number of performances I finished on the four string and five string guitar. Uh, there have been a lot of them. And so you need to have a way to transition to a string change or you just power play through it. Most of the time, the audience isn't going to notice if you don't clue them in. Your fans, folks who see you a million times, it'll become like an in joke you can have with your fans. But the, the, the most of the folks, especially the folks who've never seen you, they don't know you're making mistakes until you tell them you're making mistakes. So don't tell them. If you have a lot of electronic equipment, you need to become reasonably versed on electronics. For instance, we used to run two speakers and a device called a power amp. If one speaker failed, you still have a speaker, but if the power amp fails, you have no speakers. We switched to powered speakers. So if we lose one, we still have one. It seems simple and you can read up. There's a lot out there, but I take six guitar cables in my personal bag, not to mention the six guitar cables that are in the gig bag for the gig. We take three mic cables for every microphone because you're going to have a cable die and it's always going to be an opportune. And, you know, and then the last thing is, some things you should think about is what are you going to do with all the cases, bags, etc.? Where are you going to put them? Where do they live? You know, failure is almost impossible if you just do a small amount of planning. And sometimes, so here's my very quick story and then I'll kick it over. We were playing a St. Patty's Day outdoors. In Ohio, that means you're either wearing a t-shirt or you could be wearing a snowsuit. This was close to a snowsuit. We're playing at an outdoor band shelter, but it's a big crowd. And the band in front of us is grousing continuously about the weather and it starts snowing. It's not heavy snow. And they just finally said, F this in the middle of a song, walked off the stage. And we were sitting back with the sound crew and they looked at us and I said, does this mean we get to go on early? We get picked every year to play that festival, every single year. And we played it and we played their time slot, what was left of it and all of our time slot and we gave a thousand percent. So it was snowing. You can't let little things like that wreck your play or your set. You, you have to just, just go get it done. And if you love doing it anyways, we had a blast. And now every year we get a call from them saying, hey, are you guys available? Of course we're available. We have it on the calendar already. So learn to adjust. Just plan on it. It's a skill you have to develop. On to you, Tom. Thank you. Um, I've got a lot to cover on this one, so I'm going to intentionally talk a little quicker. Feel free to you know keep up with me on this, but I want to respect the time. But I, I do have a lot I want to unpack here. Years ago, when I really started in the SCA doing performance, Rothled made a statement to me that really helped me get away from the perfection mindset whilst on stage, especially at SCA style events. He said, you don't need perfection, you need good enough. Now, at first, like, what, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that striving for, perfect, for perfection is bad. You can and should do everything you can to make your performance intentional, enjoyable, professional in every way but something is almost certainly going to go wrong at some point and you can't let the mistake break you since my performances that of the whiskey bards they are not scripted theater we have the ability to roll with it. it we do a lot of comedy so we make fun of ourselves break the fourth wall whether it's physically pointing out our mistake and laughing at the fact that oh i am indeed human or having a humorous anecdote to make the mistake part of the show if you roll with it and don't let it discombobulate you it, it'll actually add to the show 
for us, it's become so much a part of it. We actually actively try to break each other in our shows. So it becomes very organic. And the audience is just as in on the joke at that moment as the rest of the band is, which means they're completely surprised. But our audiences have come to expect that because we're very personal in the way we perform. Uh, honestly, though, there was one instance I totally blew my line at a Penn State stage show. Simon suddenly ad-libbed the new verse of the song specifically about me forgetting my verse. And then that became a staple of future shows. Anytime I blow my verse or somebody else, that verse comes out. We have practiced that verse to death since then. So it just becomes something. Uh, I'm gonna skip another story because it's very non sequitur, but we, we have a men in black thing that we do and we totally screw it up with a neuralizer. Uh, moving on to audience members that are not engaged, you act about the drunks and such not. We actively go out to our audience. So we've been known to directly involve a distracted audience member, sit down next to them, ask a question, or one of my favorites, Somebody answered a cell phone during one of our shows. We stopped mid-song. Yonatan walked over, asked to borrow the phone for a second, greeted the person on the other end and explained that the owner of the phone is at a live show and the performers are going to sing this person a song. So we all got together. We sang an original piece that, that Yon wrote. Sounds like a four-part answering, you know, phone answering routine. You know, we did at the end, beep, 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 beep click, hangs up the phone, hands it back to them, and we started back on the next verse of the song we left and just continued going. But sometimes, because we're a comedy band in a lot of ways as well, we can get away with certain things, but a lot of that has become something happens and we are just comfortable ad-libbing and rolling with it and then taking something that works and building on it. And if it doesn't, you move on. Uh, as to whether- It's worth, uh, it's worth mentioning sorry, to just something you said. You're competing with this. Uh -huh. This is the competition. Absolutely. 20, 25 years ago, you didn't have to compete with this. Now you Correct. do. Yep. Um, you asked about weather also. Obviously, there we're talking outside venues. Always remember, and, and this is always at the top of my mind for any performance, the audience is everything. Without them, you may as well just sing in the shower because nobody cares if you screw up there and the acoustics are better. Um, it's better to ensure your audience is protected from the elements than yourself if you can. There's directional sunlight and you can shift the audience so you're looking at the sun instead of them. There's limited shade from the sun or cover from the rain. If you can reposition to protect them from the elements, do it. They will remember it. We've had uh, events ask us back and that was what they remembered is we flipped the whole thing because we're portable and we put the audience on stage and we sang out in the sunlight. And we literally had people coming into our show that knew nothing about us just so they could get free shade in a show. You know, you do what you gotta do, but you have to give your audience your best regardless of who they are or how large the audience is. Uh, we perform for a single individual for a 30 minute set. We've tossed out sets completely and done Bardic jukebox sets for small audiences where most of them knew our stuff. Uh, at a Petrero War, average is about 2,000 attendees. We've had 250 people show up to choose to be at a Bardic Showcase that we were anchoring. At Estrella, we've had over 600 people show up for a four-hour Bardic Showcase with family-friendly and then a um, body-as-you-want-to-be show afterwards. But all that was preset. This is on the last day, the final Sunday evening. 600 people that could be drinking with their friends are coming to see a show. We had performers that did not pay attention to the audience and you could see the audience wishing to be anywhere but there. Sometimes as the anchor group, we've got to completely toss out our plans, jump up and get the energy back up and step back down. Um, but if the people are choosing to be there and they could be anywhere else, especially at an SCA event, you owe them your best and you owe them the investment to give them what they want for entertainment or they can and will vote with their feet. So summed up, read the room, read the environment, know your limitations and then do your best. You're not always gonna get it right, but if you legitimately review each show afterward with an eye to how you can get better, you will indeed learn and get better. Thanks, Tommaso. There's a song that we play at the band, but it's never appeared on any of our set lists. The reason it's not on the set list is because we don't always know when we're going to do it. It's Adele's version of Make You Feel My Love, an old Bob Dylan tune. The reason that song is 
not on the set list because that song just involves me playing piano and the singer. That song is down the not on the list because lead guitar player broke a string, rhythm guitar player broke a string, you know, bass player fell off the stage because he had too much to drink. Yes, that happened with our old bass player. <laughs> My wife is laughing from the far room because she knows our old bass player. So anytime we need to kill five minutes, we've got that song ready and I can play it and Barb can sing it. It looks wonderful. It looks like we've prepared it. Well, we did prepare it. We prepared against the eventuality that something goes wrong and we need to kill three minutes for that song. Um, I do church music, music for a while, for forever. And for a while I was serving in a Lutheran church. Lutherans have communion every Sunday and I was serving the contemporary service. Now, the thing about having communion, everybody in the building comes up for communion because they're Lutherans, that's how they do it. So you never know how long that's gonna be. So you plan communion music with the band, but then you get through all your communion music and there's still 30 people in line. We had a song prepared for that. We had to do it maybe twice, but we knew enough about what we were doing that when that happened, we were ready. Um, I was in my 20s, I was playing a wedding. Uh, I was a soloist and I was doing the prelude music and I did the bridal marshal, that, that fun stuff. And the bridal party was one hour late. And prob truth be told, probably not in a state where they would be taking a legally binding vow just to say, well, I had prepared 15 minutes of prelude that I knew really, 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 really well. I managed an hour of prelude because I was familiar enough with the types of things you can play at a wedding prelude that I covered an hour. And then the, naturally there was an aunt who was more enthusiastic than in on pitch who wanted to sing or promise me, <laughs> which might not have been a wisest choice. But those are the kinds of things that are gonna happen when you play in the real world. Guitar strings break and my guitar player and probably William and certainly Brendan doesn't have the guy running off stage dressed all in black to hand you the exact same make and model of guitar, plug it in and run away. And hopefully no one noticed in the middle of your guitar solo. Uh, you'll watch the, the very high end performers do exactly that. And you're not supposed to notice the roadie, but the roadie's there and the roadie's ready against that eventuality. Well, we don't have that. So we prepare things against that case. You kick over your music stand, you have to pick it up. Uh, something goes wrong with the technology, you have to fix it. All of these eventualities are things that you need to think about in advance. Okay, if this happens, this is what we'll do. And this is how we'll cover that. Um, if you're doing anything like a stand-up comedy routine, what do stand-up comedians learn very quickly? How to deal with hecklers. And if they're good, they can chew up a heckler and spit them out and the heckler won't know what hit them. And it's amazing to see it done well. How do they learn to do that? Well, they've been, before you see them on HBO, you've seen them on, they're on the road for 10 years doing exactly that. I want, uh, Barbara Streisand had a television special years ago. And she was giving a heartfelt speech between songs. And she must have pissed off the director because they cut to a shot over Barbara Streisand's shoulder. And on the floor in front of her were two stage monitors. And between the stage monitor was a teleprompter that was built into a box that made it look like a, a stage monitor. And every word of her patter was there verbatim scrolling by and said, pause, catch your breath. And she caught her breath. And I don't know how much she must have annoyed the director for the director to put that shot in there. But 
what, why does she do that? Well, Barbara Streisand, if you know anything about her, is famously horribly crippling stage fright. So she has that in front of her so that even if she loses it in the middle of the set, it's there waiting for her. And I don't know about you, but I'm not as good as Barbara Streisand. All right, thanks very much. Um, uh, we got a minute, so I'm gonna tell a couple of war stories. Um, talking about uh, preparing to go on stage. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got was from uh, Drake the Bard. Um, he sang a song just before my set at Known War Cooks and Bards. He ended his song with this song, which was advice he had gotten from his laurel. Plant your feet, take a deep voice, take a deep breath. Plant your feet, take a deep breath. And I was feeling kind of unprepared because I was going to do Gowan and the Green Knight which is a 35 to 40 minute one man show. I played like six different characters. Um, and I was feeling a little unprepared, but I heard that song that gave me courage. I went around behind, I, I set up my chair and stuff on stage, went back around the backdrop, got myself centered, strode out on stage, planted my feet, took a deep breath and killed it for the next 45 minutes. At uh, Middle King 50, we were doing a Bardic Showcase, and Diane Liadon, uh, who have been famous in the filk scene for decades and recently discovered the SCA and brought their wonderfulness to us, they were on next, and they were sitting in their chairs like this. And the moderator said, and now, Diane Liadon, and it was like, and they were on. They were on and they killed it. Talk about breaking strings. Um, all of my instruments have the strings curled up at the ends. I, I, I never clip them off at the peg heads. And the reason is, is that I got very used to doing that because I would always break strings on my old guitar at the bridge. They would always break at the bridge. So I was doing a lot of Ren Fair busking. So I had that extra few inches curled up at the end. So I would uncurl it, pull it down, tie it off at the bridge, tune it back up to pitch. While I was doing that, I would sing, Dear boss, I write this note for to tell you of my plight. Patty's not at work today. 90 seconds, exactly as long as it takes to tune the string up to pitch. Oh, by the way, the string is already stretched out. It will stay in tune once I get it tuned up to pitch. Third thing, I'm um, talking about what happens. I was playing uh, Renfest. I did the Texas Ren Fair for eight years. And when you do a Renfest gig, busking, you do the same 10 songs over and over and over again. You get really good at those 10 songs. And so you've got several drinking songs because your job is to sell beer. You have some love songs for the cute couple. They're a young couple, they're an old couple, but you sing them a couple of love songs, they're going to tip you. Uh, if it's a single ass, mm, you never know. Um, and then there's four or five ballads, child ballads, so that you can have your street cred, and they're all the same song. They're all in the key of D or G with a capo, depending on the weather. And they are all Kalantir love songs. Verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, until everybody's dead. So it's the middle of the afternoon. It's the middle of the fair. I've been doing these songs forever, and I am not in the moment. I am not present. I am thinking about lunch. I am on autopilot. Now, I've been doing this long enough. I can be on autopilot and... My brain was not in the moment. And I come to the end of the turnaround. You know, the, the G, C, D at the end of the chorus that leads into the next verse and... 
not only do I not know who's supposed to die next, I don't know which song I'm singing. Total. There was nothing I could do. There Note is all no the recovery. All the panel people are shaking their heads in agreement with Corey. Yes. I mean, if, if you've been there, you've done that. There is no recovery. I had to stop cold. I mean, it was a brick wall, hard stop. I had I, half a dozen people in front of me, and they were just looking at me like, what the hell just happened? And I said, I am very sorry, good gentles. I'm afraid I was not paying attention, and I forgot what was supposed to happen next. So, let's do, and launched into another one. Because that was what you have to do. So, I want to thank our panelists. We have a few minutes left. Yes, we timed this out uh, right. So, if there is Q&A, three, Tona says three. Um, okay, indeed. I was looking at a, a different clock. So, three minutes. If you have a question, unmute and ask it because there's nothing in the chat. We should do this class again live somewhere via Hoot. Nothing but stories of things that went wrong. I see Dagonel's hand up. Yes. How do you deal with a heckler? <laughs> Part of me wants to just yell out mercilessly, but um, I take a heckler and I make them part of the show. I turn the humor around. I turn the heckling right back around to them. But you can't do that unless you practice in advance ways to deal with it. Sometimes you, you kind of eat it with a, a heckler. And then it, it's after the fact you're going, OK, if that comes up again, what kinds of things can I say? How can I approach it? Um, so again, it's trial and error. Sometimes you get it right. Sometimes you don't. But the main thing is you cannot let the heckler break you. You own the show. They don't. Um, and you just have to move on like any other mistake and, and treat them sometimes like a mistake. You just move on. Yeah, it's a golf. You play through. You sing over them. If we're in a bar, we had we had a guy walk up to an outside performance with a megaphone hanging and he was screaming at us that we were all going to hell for playing Irish music. And everybody was annoyed. We were having a great time. So I looked over at Master Philip the Pilgrim, who was, who was in our band in the second, and he just pushed the mains up about four, which that was the end of that. But the, uh, you know, you got you to gotta play through. You got to play through. Uh, out of respect for the next group coming in that's about to start, I think we're pretty much at time. I don't want to go over and take any of their time off. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks, gentlemen. I appreciate you teaching. All right. Thank you. Breezy, thank you thank very, you. very much. Living what we preach. Our tech crew, you are awesome. Thank you very much. We're going to tip you a percentage of what we got paid today. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it, gentlemen. <laughs>